Good morning and welcome to Quail Hollow Presbyterian Church. We are excited that you've joined us again this Sunday for our online worship service. We hope that this service will speak to you and that you can take a word with you as you go out through this week doing your daily activities. Now, let us prepare for worship. Let us pray together. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gives us birth by water and Holy Spirit, teach us how to live always in integrity of body, mind, and spirit, in obedience to your love. In the name of Jesus Christ, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory now and forevermore. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. God calls us by name into the presence of holiness as God's holy people. We answer this call by the grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of God's only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Come, let us worship God together. As we prepare to confess our sins, let us ask ourselves, how broken is our relationship with God? The price we pay for no relationship is spiritless life, which is no life at all. But in relationship with God, we find joy, peace, and everlasting love. Let us pray together. O oh God, on lonely Mount Moriah, you put your servant Abraham to the test. We confess that we have failed much lesser tests of our faith. We have allowed sin to run our lives to shape how we act towards others, and to kill our relationship with you. In your great mercy, forgive us. Change even our bodies from implements of destruction to instruments of your peace. For the sake of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God, whose name is I Am, provides for our weakness. Jesus Christ, I Am in the body, gave himself for our salvation. All who are united to Christ in his death are united to Christ in his resurrection. The end is eternal life. I declare to you, in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven.
God's peace is from everlasting to everlasting. Through Christ, God's peace becomes our gift to one another. Let us offer that gift to each other. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. May the peace of the Lord be with you. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. And also with you. And also with you. Good morning, children. Gather around the video so we can uh, do the children's message. I wanted to share with you this very nice looking watch that I've got. It's white gold and it's about 75 years old and I think it's probably worth a lot of money. Now, I got this from my neighbor about three or four months ago. I was over at his house eating dinner and it was sitting there and it was so beautiful I just had to have it so I took it and ever since then I can't put it down what was that you say it's not right to take things you say that stealing that's a sin and I shouldn't do it is that what you all are saying out there well I'll be honest with you I sort of know it was wrong to take it and when my neighbor came and knocked on my door a couple of weeks ago, he asked if I had seen this watch. And I told him I hadn't seen it because I didn't want to get in trouble. I didn't want him to find out I had taken it. I was going to try and figure out a way to maybe put it back. What's that? You say it's wrong to lie? I should have told the truth. But if I told the truth, I might get in trouble, right? Well, you all are right. It's not right to steal and it's not right to lie. Those are called sins. And we learned this week that when you succumb to sin, when you give in to sin, that that's the wrong thing to do. But God knows that we're tempted. Sometimes we see beautiful things like this watch, or we might want to tell a fib so we don't get in trouble. But that's really the wrong thing to do. And what Jesus wants us to know is that if we instead focus on being like him and being more like God, then we won't be tempted as much by sin. We won't be able to give in to it. So I think you're right. I think I need to tell my neighbor what happened and give this back to him. And I need instead, the next time I see something that I really want, don't take it, but instead, Ask my friend if he knows Jesus and talk to him about God. And that way I won't even worry about being tempted about anything. So I want you to pray with me. And before we pray, I want you to tell you that I actually didn't take this. Somebody actually did give this to me and it was from my grandfather. But I thought it was a good idea to tell you that story. So let us pray. And I want you to repeat after me. Dear Lord, thank you for helping us not be tempted. Help us to always remember that when we follow you, we are doing good things and we won't be tempted by the sins of evil. Amen.
Let us pray. Terrifying word, life-giving word, sanctifying word, come to us as one who craves water in the desert. Grant that we may hear and respond to you. Yes, in fear and trembling and also in rejoicing. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, Here I am. God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the lamb and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the moment of the Lord, it shall be provided. Our second scripture reading today is taken from the New Testament from the book of Romans. It is chapter six, verses 12 through 23. Listen again to the word of the Lord for us this morning. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, now become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage do you then get from this thing of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. 
The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. In Christ's name, amen. When I was in college, one of my colleagues, one of my classmates, was struggling with his faith, just like me and many of our other friends. But what I learned from his struggle really made me question if what I was trying to do was worth the effort. My friend, and ultimately me, were trying our best to follow what we believed was necessary for God's promised salvation. We were trying to live exclusively by the Ten Commandments. How did it go? Well, I hope you already know the answer to that question. No matter how hard we tried, we failed. Why did I believe that I needed to live by the Ten Commandments? That is an excellent question, and I don't have a good answer for you. What I can tell you is once I was freed from constantly believing that I was a total failure in living a life of sin, my life became enjoyable. Worshiping and serving others meant much more than it had in the past. It was truly a wonderful awakening for me. Now, chapter 6 of Romans is neatly divided into two parts. Paul tells us that in our baptism, we have become new creatures. We have died with Christ and are resurrected to a new life with Him. We are no longer subject to the power of sin controlling our lives, but we are alive to God in Christ, just as verse 8 states, quote, but if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will live also with Him." End quote. Paul's purpose here is to turn us around and get us heading back towards God and justification. The second part, scholars tell us that Paul states that as Christians with a new identity, which we have been liberated, but... We are required to live a life in obedience to God. Paul is trying to explain what those implications of a new life will be. And in the process, keep us moving in the right direction. The direction of sanctification. Now we know that our new life is not as simple as one, two, three. It takes a lot of work. And it takes individual focus on our lives and our behaviors. We will also need to focus on our nation and how the world sees our action towards our citizens as a government and how we treat other nations. Now our call as individuals living a life of obedience to Christ can be a difficult call. We know we all carry around stuff, distractions, guilt, and sin that prevent us from seeing the world through the eyes of Christ. We have for too long ignored social injustice that continues to plague our nation. It has caused death and suffering for so many. We ignore this even though the majority of the nation is looking for and expecting change. American citizens 
have been mistreated and oppressed due to the color of their skin, the clothes they wear, or the God they worship or don't worship. Visitors to this country are harassed and ridiculed and told to leave this country and take the virus with them. Immigrants who pick our crops and prepare our fields for planting and do many of the jobs that Americans will not do are put in cages, separated from their children, and deported. We have, from time to time, as the church, turned away from the things that are unpleasant and difficult, policies that are for the betterment of humankind. If Christ called us to take care of the poor and the oppressed, why have we continued to turn away? Could this have something to do with the fact that we are still slaves to sin? Could it be that we do not believe what Scripture tells us about being freed from sin once and for all? Or is it that we are happy with our lives? and cannot and will not devote our total being and loyalty to God. We cannot let go of our perceived good life on earth. We are free to decide whose slave we will be, slave to sin or slave to righteousness. Paul tells us that when we offer ourselves to somebody and obey him, we become a slave to the one we obey. This is true whether you're slave to sin, which leads to destruction and death, or slave, slaves to obedience, which leads to righteousness and salvation. Of course, we know if we choose to become slaves to righteousness, we reap the benefits of holiness, which leads to eternal life. But our new life does not guarantee we will not face difficulties. The problem is, surrendering our life to the control of another, even if the other is God, isn't always easy for some. We, as the people of the United States of America, believe in our civil creed of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as unchecked personal freedom for the happiness of whatever we pursue. Friends, we are all slaves to something. Maybe it's personal wealth, physical fitness, travel, work, or worse, an addiction. If we really want to know who our master is, pay attention to what occupies our thoughts and how we spend our time and our money. Chante Monroe wrote, quote, Paul understands well the appeal of freedom, but he also understands that mere freedom from the law or obligation never leads to a flourishing life unless it's linked with freedom for a higher heartfelt commitment. Paul emphasizes this in 17, in verse 17, saying, the very reason God liberates us from sin is so that we may, quote, become obedient from the heart, end quote. Now consider this. We choose to be slaves of righteousness. We support the church and the community with our financial gifts. We work at various nonprofits, feeding the poor and standing up for the oppressed. We stand with those who have suffered the prolonged injustices. However, our living the faith fails in other ways. We've all read articles and seen the polls on how young adults feel about the church. 
They become disillusioned with organized religion because they see the church as hypocritical. They witness the church saying things like, we welcome everybody to our sanctuary to worship. Nobody's excluded. And then the exact opposite is said. We don't want that type in our church. I've heard young adults commenting before about churches and their organizations within the church that work in food pantries and are involved in the communities. These young adults were excited about that. This is exactly what they were looking for in a church. But they still see the Christians hurting others by word or deed. And the young adults say, they talk the talk but don't walk the walk. We know there are many examples of Christians who profess their faith, live their faith, and are examples of what a slave to righteousness should be. As I mentioned at the beginning of this message, through our baptism to Christ, God has created the possibility of our doing the right thing. But every Christian must choose whether or not he or she will follow through. In the movie, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Jones and his party are searching for the cup of Christ. They, of course, have been betrayed. When Jones finds the cup in a cave, he encounters a knight who has been in the cave guarding the cup for over a hundred years. When the villain arrives in the cave, he chooses the cup. He chooses the wrong cup. He drinks the water from the cup and he perishes. The knight looks at Jones and says, he chose poorly. So friends, our actions define who we are. A slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. It is completely your choice. So choose wisely. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let us say together what we believe by saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born under Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, friends, let us center ourselves as we prepare our heart and mind for prayer. So let us pray together. Loving God, we come before you with praise and love in our hearts. You continue to bless us, to renew us and guide us on your path of righteousness. You remind us when we stray from your path and gently turn us around to the ways of salvation. It is only through your mercy that we are considered children of the kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for always helping us to make the right choice, the choice of love and service to all people everywhere. Lord, we are, as your people, growing weary of being separated from friends and family and our faith family. 
We can connect electronically, which is a wonderful way to stay connected. But we still miss the face-to-face. -face. The Lord in the short term, help us to remain diligent in our daily activities, being cautious where we go and how we deal with others, reminding us to protect ourselves as we maintain social distancing. We know the best that the best scientists and doctors are working on vaccines for this virus that continue to cause sickness and death. We pray, Lord, that your hands are on the hands of those working for a cure, guiding and leading them to the best possible outcome. <clears throat> Lord, we come before you today with prayers for so many, members of our church family who are suffering from disease with no cure, treatment that causes them pain and unrest. Those recovering from surgery, those in rehabilitation centers, others feeling the strain of being separated for so long. We know too, Lord, that there are those in your creation who suffer great emotional pain, and we lift them up as well. Our prayer list can go on and on, Lord, and we pray that you will bless all those that we have lifted up this day and those that are heavy on our heart. And let us not forget your creation and the tender care it requires. Guide us to be better stewards of all that you have provided. Now, Lord, let us pray together the prayer that your son taught his disciples by saying as one, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, Christ knows every breath we take. Each one is a gift from the Spirit. God watches over, protects, and provides for us. So let us present our offerings of thanksgiving for the goodness of the triune God. let us pray. God gave the only begotten Son so that we may have life through him. Let us offer our thanksgiving with the gifts of our lives. Amen.
Once again, we want to thank you for joining us in our worship service this morning at Quail Hollow Presbyterian Church. We hope that the message spoke to you. I hope that as you leave this day, that you will remember that you have a choice. You can choose being a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. And my prayer is that you choose righteousness. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Now and forevermore, amen.